Good afternoon and good and welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this update webinar with Japan Gold. My name is Jacob Wilby and I'm a VP of Research and Mining Analyst here at Red Cloud Securities. Joining me today live in person is Chairman and CEO of Japan Gold, John Proust. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation from John that will provide an overview of the company and update us on the company's various exploration properties. After that, we can take questions from participants. I'd like to remind everyone that you can begin typing in your questions right now uh, if you already have uh, questions that you know you'd like to inquire about or enter them anytime during the presentation and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the time allowed. But before we begin, we have to cover everybody's favorite subject, the disclosures. So for Japan Gold, there may be some forward-looking statements made during this presentation and I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the company's corporate presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities, please see the full disclaimer and disclosures on our website, redcloudsecurities.com. And I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only, it should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or recommendation to buy or sell securities. Also, we know that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Red Cloud's specific disclosures related to Japan Gold are the following. In the last 12 months preceding the date of issuance of the research report or recommendation, Red Cloud Securities has performed investment banking services and has been retained under a service or advisory advisory agreement by the issuer. And now I'm very pleased to introduce John Proust, who will now tell us about Japan Gold. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, glad to be here with you today. Um, on your screen, uh, you'll see our corporate presentation. Um, and this is a presentation, I'll just sort of move a little bit into the camera here, um, that uh, we released uh, on March the 9th. Um, and it's a bit of an abridged presentation uh, from what you would find on our website. But in the interest of, of time and efficiency, um, we thought this was a practical one to go uh, through with you today. So thanks very much for joining me here today. Um, if we move to the next slide, um, so on slide two, it's of course our forward looking statements. Um, Jacob referred to those already and I, I do direct you to, to review those um, uh, to gain more information about the company. Uh, if we could move forward. So people always ask me, you know, why, why Japan? Why are you in Japan? It seems like it's a, um, a destination that is uh, not at the top of many people's list for making new uh, world-class gold discoveries. And um, I think that's the, the nice thing about the world these days um, is that uh, with technology that exists, uh, with various opportunities come up, there are still really unique opportunities in the world to make these types of, uh, of discoveries. Um, we like Japan, of course, because it is um, a very geopolitically stable jurisdiction. And uh, as such, uh, with that kind of a jurisdiction, a lot of the challenges that many companies face around the world um, uh, are not our challenges. Um, it's also got a very important history of high-grade gold mining, um, a rich history that has um, really um, uh, become sort of part of the fabric of Japan, but has been really lost over the last number of years. Um, the law is, um, is a very strong law. The permitting system is one of the very best permitting systems in the world. And we were very fortunate to be able to have input on that permitting system. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's one that has worked very, very well. Um, it is a period of, of, of um, education that uh, happens when a permitting system is being put into place. But uh, again, we're very happy with the results. Um, one of the things that was really important when we first went to Japan and, and a little bit of background, we went to Japan in 2012 when there was a change in the mining law in Japan. And the change that occurred in 2012 was a, um, a modification to allow foreign mineral exploration companies to come into Japan for the very first time in the country's history. Um, and you could hold prospecting rights, you could hold mining rights, you could own a mine. Um, and the backdrop on this was that um, the gold mining industry had really stalled in 1943. Because in 1943, the second world war closed. Uh, it was the middle of the Second World War. And basically, the government required the miners to work in base metal mines and factories. So iron ore mines, steel factories. 
Um, and really after the war, only a handful of the mines reopened as the government really incented mining companies to go abroad and bring natural resources back to Japan. And so um, the, the industry has been again closed for many, many, many years. It reopened slightly in 1981 when um, the government of Japan, the Metal Mining Agency of Japan was doing a, an exploration effort on the Southern Island of Japan. And they ultimately um, made a discovery of one of the richest gold mines in the world. And it's until recent years, it's really been a very limited uh, number of people that have known about this mine. It's called Hishikari and uh, it's a, a Sumitomo metal mining asset. And I'll talk about that more in a few moments. But in any event, even after that, there was still no exploration really happening uh, throughout Japan. There's been limited of any drilling throughout the country. And part of that was driven by the fact that uh, most universities closed their geology departments. In fact, I, to our knowledge, there's only one geology department open in the whole country at, at one university. So there really was sort of a, a, a skill set that was lost over several generations. Ultimately, the, the, um, the law changed. Uh, and we were the very first entrant to go into Japan. And um, we uh, were very fortunate that we were able to access the full Japanese government database. So this is the database that is one of the, the most accurate, uh, fulsome databases that we've seen. Um, it's very, very thorough of all the, the mining records in the past. And by gaining access to that, we could very carefully uh, study the 64 closed mines. And what we were looking for uh, was what's in the picture on the screen uh, of, of this uh, slide three of our presentation. That picture is basically um, of a quartz vein um, that has a Gingaro band in it. So it has a band that holds high grade gold and silver uh, in it. Uh, that, that particular sample um, is, uh, is grading at just over 60 grams per ton gold. Um, but basically, we're looking for a type of mine that is, or, and type of um, deposit that is a low sulfidation epithermal gold deposit. So, in simple terms, we're looking for big, thick quartz veins with gold in them, and that's that's our target, and that's what we've been looking at uh, as we've done our review of the country. If we just move to the next slide, um, I'll just tell you how we've made out with that. So, yes, we're the first mover in Japan. And we have 30 gold projects covering over 40 of those closed gold mines. And virtually, um, well, all of them are low sulfidation epithermal gold opportunities or gold mines. Um, and that's the vast majority of all of that type in the whole country. Um, just recently, in the last couple of weeks, we announced a very, very significant event in our, our company's history. And this is an alliance, a strategic alliance a countrywide alliance with Barrett Gold Corp. Um, and this alliance I'll speak about in another couple of slides, but this really is a pivotal event for the company and it really uh, helps guide us in terms of where we go in the future. Um, we have a very, very strong shareholder base that includes industry participants and, um, and institutional shareholders. And we have a strong management team that has a track record of not only um, identifying uh, mineral deposits worldwide, but also with strong activity in Japan. We move to slide five. So let's talk about the Barrett Gold Alliance. So basically Barrett Gold um, has, as, as I mentioned, a countrywide alliance for 28 out of our 30 projects. Um, we've excluded two projects, uh, our two most, most advanced projects, the Akutahara project in Hokkaido and the Ora Takamine project in Kyushu. The, um, the Barrick um, program and our alliance basically has Barrick sole funding a two year initial evaluation phase on each of the 28 projects. So just to be clear about that, so Barrick is going to be evaluating 28 projects at their expense over the next two years. We'll be acting as the operator um, in order to try and find projects that they think are worthy of the Barrett criterion going forward. Um, so we're delighted to have this happen because um, with all these projects, and this was a key goal, was to get all 28 projects advanced, then we'll have a very clear understanding of our portfolio at that point. Um, some projects will come back to us and that will be fine because we'll have additional information on each of those projects and we'll be able to um, consider other third parties uh, participating on those or advancing those projects ourselves. 
and the projects that meet the Barrett criterion, they'll move on to the next level of evaluation. The fundamental point of this, of this alliance is that um, with any project that Barrick likes, in order for them to earn any interest, they have to complete a pre-feasibility study. The pre-feasibility study, um, uh, the completion of that will uh, achieve them a 51% interest in that particular project, and it will allow them to move on to a bankable feasibility. Once they've completed a bankable feasibility, then they will have earned a 75% inter interest in a project where uh, Japan Gold will be retaining a 25% interest. So it's, it's a, a wonderful uh, relationship where we'll be operating initially. Barrett can certainly step in as they need or as they wish to become operators over time, but it allows us to, um, to um, again, um, see the programs for, uh, forward uh, as, as we are. And it also allows us to retain a 25% interest in any project that uh, goes through to a bankable feasibility study. So we're, we're fully carried through that um, with, uh, with Barrick sole funding. So let's move on to the next slide. Just to touch on our shareholders um, and something that makes Japan Gold very, very unique. Um, on the circle that's on the left-hand side of the slide, um, you can see that management owns 26% of the company. Um, and so we're well invested in, in the business. We have a public float of approximately 30%, but really it's the red area that I would highlight the 44% because we're a very unique company in that we have a, an important um, you know, countrywide alliance on 28 projects with Barrick. Um, and that alliance, by the way, um, also includes that if Barrick identifies new opportunities, they'll be introduced to the alliance. And if we inter identify new opportunities in Japan, we'll introduce those to the alliance as well. But at the top of our, our shareholder list that we've highlighted here, we have Newmont Gold Corp, which is now Newmont. Now, of course, Newmont um, being one of the top two gold mining companies in the world, along with Barrick, um, are a very important partner and a relationship. And so they own a 16% stake in our company. And one of the reasons why we um, excluded two projects from the Alliance were that those two advanced projects um, have a, on, on those two projects, we have what's called a joint venture right of first refusal with Newmont. So that means, should we want to partner with Newmont to advance those projects, or should we want to pro uh, partner on those two projects to advance those, a joint venture partner, Newmont is the party that we would go to first. Um, and so it's an important relationship. Um, Newmont has been very kind to assist us in those two projects in terms of geoph geophysical advice, and other operational uh, ideas that they have, and we appreciate uh, their input. So um, it's very rare to have the top two gold mining companies in the world embedded in one company, one junior company like Japan Gold. In addition to that, we have some excellent um, shareholders, institutional shareholders, uh, resource capital funds from Denver, um, one of the largest resource funds in the world, their opportunities fund, um, BlackRock manages two very large Japanese funds, and they are shareholders of ours. Uh, Donald Smith and Libra are two um, New York investors, and then McKenzie uh, from Toronto. So we have a very, very strong uh, institutional base and, and industry uh, representation. Um, our market capitalization today, um, given the current market conditions, um, is about $40 million. And um, um, again, we find that that, uh, that is a, a very, very low valuation relative to the partnerships that we've put in place. We've also spent $25 million in Japan building uh, the, the, the base that we're at now. So let's move on to the next slide. So I wanted to just touch on the Hishikari gold mine. I mentioned it previously, and um, a number of you may have seen pictures of the Hishikari gold mine. But suffice to say that this is um, one of the most impressive and high-grade gold mines in the world. Um, in the lower um, photo, you'll see that there's a, a miner, a, a small fellow standing um, by the, the base of that, that wonderful looking vein. And these are, of course, the types of targets that we're looking for. Um, in this case, 7.8 million ounces have already been produced from the Hishikari gold mine at an incredible 30 to 40 grams per ton, which is an extraordinarily high grade worldwide. And they do have very significant reserves remaining. What's unique about the Hishikari mine is not only the deposit and the grade, but it's also the um, uh, the methodology with which they process their ore. 
So they actually mine the ore. Um, it's at a fairly shallow depth between 200 and 300 meters. Um, and it's basically brought to the surface, surface and the, the vast majority, um, about 90%, is actually the ore is directly shipped off site to a smelter, to a Sumitomo smelter. The Sumitomo smelter um, requires, as part of their smelting process, the white material, the quartz or the silica, as it's called, um, as part of their smelting process. And so it makes for a very efficient um, system uh, for, for handling the ore. The other 10% is actually shipped off site to a large cyanide treatment plant that's been operating since the 1950s. Um, and so what's unique about Japan is that there are a number of copper smelters. There's five that we've highlighted that are the dominant copper smelters in Japan that are all looking for this type of material, so quartz or silica, um, for their, for their uh, process. And so those um, smelters have approached us to talk about the, um, the uh, idea of if we're reopening an old mine or if we've discovered and built a new mine, that they would actually buy our ore at, at the gate from us, basically take away our waste, which is the silica or the quartz, and then return 95% of our gold back to us. And what that does from an economic analysis is, is it really creates a, an extraordinary um, um, economic benefit that uh, is reflected in the internal rate of re returns. The IRR just uh, really spikes up based on that sort of thing. So it's something we'd love to pursue, um, but first we've got to move on to make some discoveries. So let's move on to the next page. All right, um, so in Japan, we have a very strong operational team. So we made a decision when we went to Japan in 2012 and after we studied the country for two years and then started applying for projects that um, we would have Japanese geologists and international geologists. We'd bring in our own drilling machines. We have four uh, drills uh, that we own, Diamond Core drill machines in country. We built our own drilling division of international experts that are in country. Um, and we've got a very strong management team. So we're well, uh, well established in country. And I think that's what's attracted Barrick and Newmont to us uh, as a, as a, uh, a company to partner with. Um, this sketch actually shows you the uh, three islands of Japan, Hokkaido in the north, Honshu in the middle, and Kyushu in the south. Um, and it highlights the areas where the active gold mines were located uh, in 1943. And really, the, the bulk of our focus has been in the northern island of Hokkaido and the southern island of, of Kyushu, as the other areas are either closed or mined out. So let's move on to the next slide. So this slide now takes Japan today and shows you where our 30 projects are located. So we have 11 projects up in Hokkaido, of which uh, the ones, all the ones on this map that are outlined in red are in the Barrick Alliance. Uh, one of the projects up in Hokkaido uh, in, is outlined in blue, the Akutahara project, and that's the project that we've excluded from the Barrick Alliance. Um, we have one project in Honshu, uh, the long thin island, and then on the southern island, we have 18 projects there. And again, you see one blue outlined label. So let's do a, a little deeper dive into that and move on to the next slide. I'm now taking you to Kyushu and the southern island of Kyushu. And uh, if we could just go back to the previous slide for a moment. The previous slide for the, um, of Kyushu, if you look carefully at that, you'll see a collection of red dots sort of in the, the middle or north area of Kyushu, and then a real concentration at the south end. Um, there are two gold provinces uh, one in the middle north and one in the south. And the one that's most active and uh, the most prolific gold province is the one in the south. So when we move to the next slide, that'll put it in context for you. So here we are in the, the uh, gold province. So we've got a fairly complicated uh, map here, but basically the purple outline shows you the, um, the gold province that is called the Southern Kyushu Epithermal Gold Province. Um, in that gold province, um, you will see um, just down from the top, you'll see a label saying the Hishikari Mine, and there is a mine mark just to the left of that. So that's the Hishikari Mine and the very tiny footprint that Sumitomo Metal Mining has. All the red outlined areas are projects of Japan Gold that are under the Barrick Alliance. And there's one project in blue that is a, the one project that's excluded from the Barrick Alliance that has the joint venture right of first refusal with Newmont. 
Um, there are four major producing mines that have made this the pro most prolific gold producing province in Japan. And well over 11 million ounces of very high grade gold has been produced from this area. So what we've done very, very carefully is we've studied this area. We've looked at the setting of the Hishikari mine and where there might be other similar settings. And we have applied for all the key areas in this uh, Southern Kyushu epithermal gold province. So we're very pleased to be there. With the blue outlined area, I will note that you'll see five mine markers across that, uh, that uh, uh, project area. Um, those are five uh, mines that basically extend over approximately 10 kilometers from the southwest to the northeast. And they were all mines, high grade underground gold mines, very shallow, that were closed in 1943. What we're doing right now, um, and we started in January, um, are a couple of very important, three very important programs. So we've already drill permitted this area. We've done an initial drill hole there that we've embargoed the results on. Um, and we have now done very detailed geophysics. We've done, uh, uh, sorry, um, we've done gravity and we've done CSAMT geophysics. So we've done both types of geophysics there that have really um, been important tools for us up in Hokkaido and we think will be important tools for us here. And then we've also done a soil sampling program, a detailed soil sampling program uh, through this whole area as well for, for the large bulk of this area. Um, once we get those results back, which we're expecting in the next four to six weeks, then the, that'll allow us to, to uh, uh, refine our drill program and consider um, how we move forward from here uh, in terms of, of restarting that program. So we're excited to uh, to analyze that data. Uh, samples, uh, the, the soil samples are now at the uh, the ALS lab in North Vancouver uh, being analyzed and our geophysics data is being analyzed not only by ourselves, but also Newmont is looking very care carefully at that data as well. So we can move on to the next slide. So now we're gonna go all the way up to the other end of the country to Hokkaido. Now, um, the third uh, gold province, um, or probably the second most important gold province in Japan, um, is uh, this area in northern Hokkaido. Um, it's called the Katami Metallogenic Province, and again, it's outlined in purple. Um, and the red areas that you see highlighted here are our project areas that are in the Barrick Alliance, and the blue area is the project area that's excluded, but that's in the Newmont Joint Venture Right of First Refusal. Um, before I talk about our projects too much, I will note on this slide that um, I, there is another company that's in Japan um, and uh, great to see more juniors and, uh, and majors in Japan as, as uh, people are, are learning about this, this opportunity in this country. Um, and so on the left hand side at the north uh, or the, the, the top of the, sli the slide is our Sanru project and directly ab abutting that to the north is the Irving Omu project. Um, so this is a project that's got an awful lot of attention uh, through Irving. Um, they've had some very good success um, in drilling uh, certain prospects on that project area with the, the, the best success really being uh, right in the southern area along uh, just north of our, our, our northern border. So we're um, you know, eagerly awaiting any further news from the OMU project and um, we expect to be um, active on this ground um, once the snow melts uh, in Hokkaido. I, I will say that Hokkaido has a very different climate than say Kyushu. So um, when we're active in Kyushu right now, it's approximately 20 degrees Celsius. Um, there's lots of, um, uh, of animals down there. I'm, I always mention there's monkeys, there's wild boars and other things running around. Hokkaido is just the opposite and um, it's minus 20 to minus 25 up in Hokkaido. It's been very active in terms of snow and blizzards coming through. And really uh, we tend to close our operations there from the end of December through to the end of um, April. And then we resume sort of May 1st uh, with Golden Week and we, we get after it there. And that's our plan for this year. Um, I'm gonna take you to the Akutahara project because that's our most advanced project, the one in light blue now. And we'll move to the next slide and then I'll show you what we've been doing there. So here we are in the Akutahara project. Um, the quick takeaway here is the Akutahara project is about 200 square kilometers. And it's all the areas that you see outlined either in bold lines or in dotted lines there. Um, the bold lines indicate areas where we actually have prospecting rights and we can now get drilling permits to start drilling those areas. The other areas that just have dotted lines around them, we haven't wanted those areas yet to drill, so we've left those um, just as, as uh, prospecting rights applications. 
There's 20 historic mines, high-grade underground gold mines or significant surface workings that are, um, uh, are uh, showcased here on this slide. You can see the mine markings and the labels besides them. We've done significant geology, geophysics, geochemistry across this project area. And what we've been looking for is concentrations of mines where there might be collections that are actually parts of large systems. Um, and one such area is highlighted um, in the, the, uh, the top right-hand area of that map uh, in the purple dots. In that area, we've now found eight mines. And, and this is an area, by the way, that runs about six and a half kilometers north-south to four to five kilometers east-west. East we've now identified eight mines, eight historical mines that are underground mines or su significant surface workings that are all part of a large system. And they revolve around sort of a light pink uh, blob that's right in the middle. And that blob is actually, um, this is a geological map and it's a rhyolitic dome where we feel that the fluids from deep in the earth, the, the rich mineral bearing fluids have come up around the dome margins and then have moved into the formations and have created the, uh, the historic mining opportunities that were all closed in 1943. With the exception of our activities and one government um, um, hole that was more scientific related, there's not been any drilling in this area. So it's, it's, it's not only under drilled, it's virtually devoid of drilling, uh, which again um, creates wonderful opportunities for us. Um, I've highlighted in red two areas here that are areas of focus uh, in 2020. So the area that we've um, recently released results on, and I'm gonna talk about in a moment, are the oval that's um, called the Catano Gold Prospect. And we'll, we'll touch on that in a moment. But just to move to the, the uh, top left, the Rio mine, this is a mine that we're just going through the permitting process now for permitting to drill. And that we expect to be our first drill program when we resume operations in May. Um, a little background here, this is a mine that was mined right up to 1943. It was a large hill that had five adits that went uh, into it where um, prospectors had originally found very rich veins and they followed these veins into the, into the hillside um, and, then, and then sort of moved on when they mined those veins out. Um, they generally have stopped when they got to the water table because they didn't really have the pumping capacity at that time. But interesting information that we found was that Sumitomo uh, went into one of the adits in 1951 after the war, and they went in 73 meters, um, and they were just sampling. So they, from the top or the backs of the adit going in, they took chip samples all the way going in, and those chip samples averaged over 40 grams per ton, an extraordinary grade. Um, yet there's been no activity in this area since then. So our drill program here will focus on not only evaluating what was done historically in the mine, but looking at depth extensions and looking at parallel structures. Um, so now let's move on to the Catano Gold Prospect. So the red oval that I just highlighted before was three kilometers east to west. And this is um, an aerial photo from 1947 that's at that same three kilometers. Um, and I wanted to show you this because basically this shows how disturbed the area was at the time. This was a surface area where um, the um, mining activity had basically happened in the western area and there was a very large production facility. They basically had taken off the tops of these hills because there was gold right near the surface of these hills and put it through a production facility. Unfortunately, in 1943, this mine was closed down. The miners were taken away. It was abandoned and no one has ever gone back. Um, so now if we know, move to the next slide, um, this is what we found in our drilling activity. So this is the same three kilometers. And um, so uh, this cross section basically shows you that western side or west Catano. Um, and at the surface, that's where the mining was done. And we drilled six drill holes um, under those, those uh, mine workings to see what was beneath them. We found significant um, veining, so quartz veining beneath those, but we didn't find the grades of gold that we were looking for. And what that told us was that we were too far away from the feeder zones that actually brought the gold up to the surface. Because with, with low sulfidation epithermal gold um, uh, opportunities or hydrothermal systems, uh, basically these systems come up from deep in the earth um, and you think sort of like a volcano and then they sort of spill out at the top uh, or like lava. Um, and so, um, if you find quartz, but it has low grades of gold in it, it means that you're 
um, far, too far away from the feeder zone to, to, you're not close enough to the feeder zone. So what we did with Newmont support is we did significant geophysics, gravity and CSAMT across this whole area. And then not only that, but we went and we started sampling going to the east. And what we did was as we an analyzed the sampling going to the east, we found the gold grades got higher and higher and higher. And right back to that first rock that I showed you on the one of the early slides, we found that high grade 60 gram material, quartz veining, et cetera. But we also found another indicator mineral called antimony, which um, uh, and very high concentrations in the east, which give you a good strong indicator that you're getting very close to the feeder zones. So we're right now through the winter months, permitting the, um, the sort of right hand two kilometers or the eastern two kilometers of this prospect so that later on in the year after we drill the Rio mine, we can move into this area and start drilling in the areas that uh, you know, we're now being directed to by the geophysics and by the, uh, the sampling that we've done. So let's move on to the next slide. This is never uh, just an, a plan view of the same thing. So you can see the left-hand side, West Catano, that's outlined in a sort of a, a purple square um, uh, outline. That's where we did our original six holes of drilling. And then you can see East Catano where we're proposing to drill and the bright green areas that are highlighted are the high grades of antimony that are occurring in the East. Next slide, please. All right, um, many of you may know that we do have a very, very strong board of directors. Um, and a lot of it revolves around Mitsuhiko Yamada, who's our representing director in Japan. And Mr. Yamada is one of the top mining executives in Japan having been the past CEO of Sumitomo Corporation, their global minerals division. Um, so he's got a very, um, uh, very much a worldwide view of many projects that they had internationally, but of course is very much focused on um, the restart of the gold mining industry in Japan. Um, to his right is Bob Gallagher, um, who uh, was previously the president of Newmont in Indonesia and built the Batahijau mine, a $2 billion mine that a billion dollars came from uh, Sumitomo Corporation um, when Mr. Yamada was under that, that leadership role. To Mr. Yamada's left is John Carlisle. Um, John Carlisle was with the BHP Global Gold Group that 30 years ago did a study on uh, Japan and gave very good uh, indications of the opportunities there, but the the um, the mining law had not been changed at that point. And so John became, went on to become the president of Newcrest in Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, and uh, um, uh, made a, a significant discovery there in, in the uh, in Indonesia called Gosawang. Um, Dr. Mike Andrews, a, a very well-known geologist, um, is part of our team as well. Dr. Sally Ayer, again, a well-known mining executive, and Murray Flanagan on the, the, the finance side. So a very, very strong group. If we now move to the next slide, um, we have a, a, a very experienced leadership team. Um, our country manager is Andrew Rowe. Uh, Andrew Rowe has extensive experience in many um, Australasian uh, companies, or, or countries, pardon me, um, and uh, is our country manager and vice president of exploration. Uh, so uh, a lot of experience being brought into Japan. Uh, to his right is Takashi Kuriyama. So Mr. Kuriyama, along with um, uh, other executives at Sumitomo Metal Mining, must retire when they turn 65. And so we were very, very fortunate that as soon as um, Mr. Kuriyama turned 65, he joined our company as our general manager of exploration. Um, prior to that, uh, for the previous 10 years, he'd been on the Tech Resources Board um, as a director. And prior to that, um, he had been um, the, uh, and along with that, pardon me, he'd been the head of global exploration for Sumitomo Metal Mining. Prior to that, he'd been the general manager and chief geologist at the Hishikari Gold Mine. So he's our general manager of exploration and has a wealth of experience in Japan and a real specific focus in Kyushu. Um, Dr. Oga, to his right, is a mining engineer. He was the, one of the first people that we hired in Japan, and he comes from one of three universities that we collaborated with, the University of Hokkaido. Um, he is an, uh, has been a, an associate professor there, but he's also an expert in permitting in, in Japan, having led permitting initiatives in the coal bed, methane, and the geothermal space. And Vince Boone is our chief financial officer. Next slide. We also have two very well-known um, members on our board of advisors. Many of you will know Steve Garwin. Steve Garwin is an is a, 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 a internationally renowned expert in um, in gold mining. 
Um, he uh, originally was the um, uh, chief geologist in Nevada for Newmont for 10 years after completing his PhD at the Bata Hijau mine. But following that, um, he moved on to, to really a, a consulting role globally and has worked with companies like um, um, Soul Gold, as an example, um, where he's the chief technical advisor. He was also the co-author of the 100th uh, anniversary edition of the Society of Economic Geologists study on Japan with uh, the renowned uh, professor, Japanese professor Yasushi Watanabe. So we've really got some great expertise there and we appreciate his participation. Um, very recently, we've just announced that Paul Harbage has joined us uh, on our board of uh, advisors. Um, Paul has a wealth of international experience. Um, um, in the early days, uh, one of the predecessor or the predecessor uh, to um, uh, to Barrick or the merger recent merger partner Rand Gold, um, Paul was very active uh, there, leading the exploration efforts uh, for Rand Gold, and in that capacity, made five very significant discoveries in Africa, five world-class discoveries of many, many millions of ounces of gold. Um, he then moved from Rand Gold to uh, Gold Corp, um, and that's where we originally uh, met Paul, uh, where Paul was uh, leading the uh, global exploration efforts for Gold Corp, and uh, that's how the Gold Corp Newmont uh, um, investment was originally gal galvanized. Um, he currently is the CEO of GT Gold, a very promising company in the province of British Columbia. But we really uh, appreciate his interest in Japan and its global expertise. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, Japan Gold is a very unique opportunity. Um, we are the first mover in Japan. We've put together a, a very important portfolio of 30 outstanding projects throughout the country. The quality of these projects have been uh, strong enough to attract Newmont and now to attract Barrick in our, our alliance on 28 out of our 30 projects. Um, we're sole funded on 28 projects. Um, and, and, and that's important to note in, in this kind of market and this kind of day and age that um, we have a lot of flexibility. We can advance the two independent projects that we have um, as aggressively or as passively as we like. But we, um, from a funding perspective, we are carried by Barrick through the evaluation of these projects. And that includes our personnel um, as we're the operator and our teams are put to work. I will tell you that um, right now, uh, we are currently marshalling six teams in country um, to do a major program in Southern Kyushu. Um, we're, we'll be covering over 900 square kilometers, a major regional program there um, that will include um, significant um, stream sediment sampling over that 900 square kilometers. So we'll be blagging there all the streams and waterways. Um, we'll also be doing two significant geophysics programs, uh, gravity programs across that you know, area or entire area. So we've got um, major work uh, that is about to undertake and our start is uh, our starting uh, dates. Uh, we're looking at the end of March. So we have our people in country, they're being organized now and they're getting ready to get the boots on the ground and, and get after that. Once that is completed, our teams are then going to move to um, um, northern uh, areas of Japan. So we'll move up to Honshu and then we'll move up to Hokkaido and we'll repeat those same uh, significant regional programs over all of the, uh, the balance of our projects there. So we're going to have an awful lot of information uh, 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 coming together to really highlight the best prospects in the country. Um, you know, Barrick is focused very much on trying to make a new major discovery in Japan like Hishikari. And so they want to systematically go through the country and try and identify those areas that are most prospective. And uh, we're going to be there right along with them to do that. Um, again, independently, we have our two projects that I've highlighted for you. We have significant programs planned for this year. And uh, we really appreciate the support of Newmont on those, on those programs and on those two project areas. Um, so we've got a very, very strong balance of, um, of outside experts that are working with us of financial capability uh, working with us and a very strong team and operations group that um, will take Japan forward. And as someone uh, recently said to me, if there's another elephant to be found in Japan, we will find it. Uh, so thank you very much for, for joining me today and I'll turn it back over to Jacob.
Thank you, John. Um, we can now uh, move on to take some uh, on the online participants. Um, so looking ahead, uh, uh, just queuing up some of them. Uh, there's one question there asking about, uh, do you have any, any sort of control over which projects Berg elects to do research on and exploration, or do they get to choose that themselves? Well, that's a good question. Um, so they're quite agnostic about the projects initially. So there's no favorites or less favorites going into it. They take it from a very holistic and high level where they actually are looking at the whole country and sort of region by region. So Southern Kyushu, Middle Kyushu, Honshu, Hokkaido, and then trying to scope into areas that are going to be of highest priority. So there's no priority uh, project uh, schedule at this point. Okay. Um, another question from online asking um, if Barrick is providing you geologists or geophysicists to help you in the exploration. Right. So we've. Um, so the answer is um, there's already um, discussions and programs underway to start seconding people to us. Um, and we've had detail or some discussions already, and I think we're going to have some more detailed discussions um, upcoming shortly about how we're doing that. They have confidence in our teams to go forward and initiate these all undertakings. And of course, it's not only our teams, but we're bringing in international experts that, as an example on the geophysics. So a company called Haynes is in country with us now leading the, the geophysics programs. Okay. Um, you did mention um, the, the different weather situations between Hokkaido and, and uh, Kyushu, which is probably something most participants weren't very familiar with. Uh, myself, I lived in South, South Korea for a year, so uh, I was aware of that. But I'm just curious, are you able to work year-round in Kyushu if you wanted to? A absolutely. Now, when we look at Kyushu, so th here's the, the things that we have to consider. In Kyushu, um, um, we, it, it's a subtropical area. So the issues that you you look for are are there typhoons? Are they going to be are they going to be you know rainstorms that are going to come through? Um, we're quite familiar with those, and so we we move our activities around. Obviously, if we see any real inclement weather, the good news that we found so far is that uh, once we're established on a site, maybe we're going to do a drilling program or whatever. Um, while there there may be disruptions relative to rain, we've got the ability to move forward. But we're, we're conscious of that, but certainly Kyushu all year round. Now, when we move up to Hokkaido, that's when we have a slightly different window because our operational season, um, when our base is open, is May 1st through to December 31st. So we're active throughout that period, um, but we, we, we aren't, uh, aren't silent in the, those other months. So basically what we do is we close our base at the end of December, then we take the operational group and that could be drills, it could be people, and we have the ability to, because they're quite mobile, we can move them down to Kyushu, and then we have a special permitting team that moves into what we call our winter office in Hokkaido, and they organize us for the ensuing year to start in May. And so that's what's happening right now with the Rio permitting and with the Catano East permitting that's going on. Okay, um, there are several questions from online um, in regards to the COVID-19 uh, outbreak uh, globally now, um, and how have has that so far affected you, or or would it affect you, you know, right. possibly? Yeah, and look, that's that's a very real concern, and and um, I think it's on everybody's mind today. Um, you know, I'm happy to be talking to you about Japan Gold, but uh, there are other global uh, intervening uh, events that are that are so important. Um, so the way it's worked for us is as follows. Um, first of all, in Japan, Japan has a very, um, a very a strong um, healthcare system. Um, it's a first world country. It's one of the safest countries in the world. So that's uh, the, the, those are several sort of aspects that are the backdrop. Secondly, um, they've been very proactive. So as this virus emerged, you know, schools were closed, businesses were closed, areas were quarantined. You know, they they really took proactive steps. And one of the important things uh, for you know, our audience that hasn't maybe been to Japan is that um, people um, really follow direction from the government. So if the government says, don't leave your house for seven days, you don't leave your house for seven days. It's not, well, people are running to the airport to try and sneak out somewhere else or do something. It's, it's very serious. People take it exactly the way it is. 
And so, you know, as we follow this 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 um, this virus and 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 the the various developments that are happening, you know, um, obviously containment or managing it is one of the most important things. And when you've got a whole population base working together with government that's responsible and proactive, you've got the best chances of, of, of making the least disruption in the country as well. The other thing, of course, with Japan is they have the longest longevity in the world. So as it relates to the older population base, um, they're very healthy. You know, 65 is sort of like 50 in many countries. So so you have you have that part as well. Um, as it relates to kind of, a, uh, so, so there's that. I guess the next piece uh, is that, you know, we operate from an office in Tokyo and all our people are working remotely at home now. So um, unless it's urgent or necessary, no one goes to our office, they work from home, but we're all interconnected. And so it's all working very, very efficiently. We have a base in Kyushu, we have a base in Hokkaido, and the people that are in the, the uh, Hokkaido or in the Kyushu base right now um, are all organized. They're all remote and removed from, um, you know, from any large population centers, et cetera, et cetera. So they're ready to go on their, their basis. As we look at a more macro uh, picture, I think some things are going to happen here um, as it relates to our, our mineral exploration and mining community. Um, and it's something that we've seen sort of going back to 2008 and other times when you're going to get into companies that are what I call have and have not companies. Um, you know, we're very, very fortunate that we have Barrick as our alliance partner in Japan. Um, they're sole funding our projects. They're on 28, 28 project areas. Um, they are working with us to design the programs and to make sure we're getting the right work done and done efficiently and effectively. And so um, that really insulates us to a certain degree from the vagaries of the junior, you know, capital market and um, and, and other aspects. Um, and to support that, recently uh, the company, uh, so Japan Gold, has taken on a loan from one of our largest shareholders, uh, which is um, which is effectively the management group um, from Southern Arc. We've taken on a million dollar loan just to, to bolster our, our finances. So, so we're in very solid shape there. So I think companies that um, are, are you know, low on capital and have no partnerships and relationships, you know, there might be some real challenges, but I think we're very much an outlier. We're one of the ones that um, are that one, you know, one tenth of 1% that has a real direction, a real focus and is in the right, um, you know, uh, a geographic area, the right geopolitical area, and has the right partners. I think we have time for perhaps one more question. Yeah. Um, there's a question from online asking um, if Newmont is providing you funding for the projects that you're joint ventured on there. Right. As Barrick. Yeah. So um, at this time, we haven't, um, um, it, just to go, go back, we have two projects um, that are excluded from the Barrick Alliance. The Okudahara project, our advanced project up in Hokkaido, and the Ora Takamine project in Kyushu. Um, both those projects, we have not elected to um, uh, go through the joint venture right of first refusal with Newmont at this time. Um, so we've elected to advance those projects ourselves. And as I say, in Kyushu, we've just completed two programs of geophysics, a major, major soil sampling program, and we're waiting to finalize those results and then determine the restart of our drilling program there. Um, always an opportunity for us, um, and it's something certainly that that uh, is, is in our, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity. It, it's one of the, the uh, considerations that we can have going forward. Okay, great. I think uh, we'll have to cut it off there in the interest of time. Um, but we'd like to thank you very much for coming into our office and being here today to update us on uh, all of the company's activities. Yeah, my pleasure. I appreciate everybody being with uh, with us today and with uh, with me today to, to learn a little bit more, understand a little bit more about Japan Gold. Um, we're certainly committed to advancing the company. Um, we have you know a very well thought out program going forward that we've been putting in place for a number of months now, uh, as, as uh, you know, many of you have, have followed us. And, um, you know, notwithstanding the global disruption that's occurring at this point, we are committed to advancing our company and to make the new uh, and the next world-class discovery uh, in Japan. Great. Thank you very much for participating. This has been Japan Gold uh, with Red Cloud Securities.